Okay, my name is Janky Webster and I'm Head of Advocacy and Policy Impact and a professor specialising in food policy here at the George Institute for Global Health. I'd like to start by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land upon which we meet today, the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, and pay my respects to elders past, present and future. Thanks to everyone for joining today. I think we've got about 300 people online and around the world for this year's World Food Day. World Food Day marks the founding of the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations in 1945. So we're celebrating 75 years. And this theme is grow, nourish, sustain. Together, our actions are our future. And we're thrilled today to have Professor Mosafarian um, here to talk. He's talking about food, COVID-19 and sensible food policy, time to fix food. And we'll be dedicating a good half an hour towards question and answers after the presentation. And we encourage everybody to submit their questions into the box. I'm sure there's going to be a lot. So World Food Day is about tackling global hunger and the need to ensure food security and nutritious food for all. Today, more than ever, the availability of healthy food to curb and manage non-communicable diseases is crucial. Obesity makes us vulnerable to non-communicable disease such as cancer, heart disease and type 2 diabetes, which are leading killers in Australia and around the world. Obesity also makes us much more vulnerable to the serious adverse outcomes from the SARS COVID-19 infection. Managing the pandemic effectively will take not only a short-term look at con infection control, but also a long-term view of population health. And that's why we're really pleased to have Dr. Mustafarian with us here today. Dr. Mustafarian is a cardiologist, dean, and Jean Mayer professor at the Tufts Friedman School of Nutrition, Science and Policy, and also professor of medicine at Tufts Medical School. He's authored more than 400 scientific publications on dietary priorities for obesity, diabetes, and cardiovascular diseases, and on evidence-based policy approaches to reduce these burdens in the US and globally. So welcome, Dr. Mustafarian. Thanks so much for sharing your insights with us today. Over to you to share your slides. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, it's really a, a great pleasure and honor to be speaking at, you know, at the George Institute uh, virtually on World Food Day. I view the George Institute as, you know, really a um, sister institution to our school. We focus uh, at Tufts on nutrition science and policy, you know, understanding the best science and then translating that. And I think that's something the George Institute does supremely well. And I look forward to further uh, discussions and collaborations around really the top issue for health, uh, which is food. Uh, and so, you know, people often ask me, you know, you're a cardiologist, how did you get into the, the food and nutrition, and my response is, you know, why isn't every cardiologist studying and, and focusing on food and nutrition? Now, this is the single biggest issue for health on the planet, full stop. Um, you know, poor eating causes, uh, uh, you know, hundred, hundreds of millions of, of deaths uh, over time due to chronic diseases and also due to hunger uh, and disparities. And so if you care about health, food has to be, and the food system has to be at the top of the list of what we study. This also has enormous economic consequences for healthcare costs and access and for government budgets and for private business and economic growth. And I think that has been uh, underemphasized by public health uh, uh, academics and by public health policymakers, drawing the clear connections between health and dollars. If we don't draw the connections to the dollars, we're not gonna see action. And so I think we really need to, to draw those connections. This is also you know, the single biggest issue on the planet for, for sustainability and climate change. 25% of greenhouse gas emissions, 70% of the world's water use, 90% of tropical deforestation, stress to the oceans. This is the single biggest sustainability issue on the planet. And lastly, this is a major issue for national security. We have a wonderful organization here in the United States called Mission Readiness, which is uh, nearly 800 retired admirals and generals from the U.S. Armed Forces that are talking about poor nutrition and inadequate access to healthy food as a major national security threat. And I put all those things together because as we think about policy actions, we have to combine these things. If we talk to MPs in Australia just about health and just about disparities, you'll get a lot of friendly nodding, but no action will happen. And, and if you talk to businesses about health, and disparities, you'll get friendly nodding, but no action will happen. You have to bring in the dollars and the economic 
uh, imperative of fixing these things and also the sustainability and national security imperatives. So just as an example, the United States um, and, and Australia is a little bit healthier, but not that much different, unfortunately. It's really crazy how sick we have become in, in much of the world. More people are sick than are healthy. Being healthy for an adult is now the exception. In the United States, half of all adults have prediabetes or diabetes. More than half have some form of cardiovascular disease. Three in four are overweight or obese. And if you put together adiposity, glucose, blood pressure and cholesterol, only 12% of adults are actually metabolically healthy. And in the United States, this has led to, to crazy rises in healthcare costs over 50 years from about 5% of government budgets to nearly 30% of government budgets, hundreds of billions of dollars of spending. And while Australia doesn't spend as much on healthcare as the United States, a huge portion of your, of your budget and of your uh, uh, healthcare spending is due to diet-related illness. And I think COVID-19 has really laid bare the fragmentation and, and broken nature of our food system, um, whether it's for immunity, that we don't have a population that has uh, robust immune systems to fight off the virus, whether it's the rise in food insecurity due to lost jobs and disrupted supply chains, the comorbid risks, um, you know, Jackie mentioned obesity and diabetes is major risk. I'll, I'll talk about that a little bit for COVID-19. The impact on, on our elders due to hidden hunger and poor access to healthy foods, the, the disparities in these issues, uh, again, the disrupted supply chains, lost jobs, the confused public, all of this um, you know, shows that food is crucial to, to think about to have a resilient population. And you know, when it comes to COVID-19, there has been so much research now that shows that diet-related diseases, in particular diabetes, obesity, and hypertension, are the top risk factors for poor outcomes from COVID-19. If you are healthy and don't have diabetes, obesity, or hypertension, COVID-19 on average is fairly, you know, uh, 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 is not a severe disease. Um, it's more like a very severe flu. Uh, uh, it can, of course, still kill you, but, but the chances are quite low. If you're sick with diabetes, obesity, or hypertension, or some other related conditions, far, far worse outcomes. And now, just in the last few months, growing science indicates likely why. COVID-19 is not just a respiratory virus, it's a vascular virus and it's an inflammatory virus. In addition to infecting you know, the, the alveoli of the, of the lung, it affects the endothelial uh, cells of the blood vessels throughout the body. This leads to all of the uh, off-target effects outside of the lungs, the kidney failure, the strokes in the brain, the um, myocarditis in young, otherwise healthy people, the long hauler syndrome where people have symptoms many months after they recover. And so I think of COVID-19 as a heat sinking missile for poor metabolic health because diabetes, obesity, and hypertension, what do they share in common? They're all diseases of disrupted endothelial function and they're all diseases of inflammation. And so these papers looking at you know, disruption to the, to the endothelium and, and inflammation really highlight that COVID-19 is a disease uh, uh, that has been set up to infect us if we have poor, poor metabolic health. And so I think about COVID-19 as a fast pandemic sitting on top of a slow pandemic. The fast pandemic is the virus. The slow pandemic is the global pandemic of diabetes and obesity that's really happened just over the last 30 or 40 years. This is not something that has happened over 100 years or even 50 years. Just the last 30 or 35 years, we've had a global pandemic of diabetes, obesity, and hypertension, much of that related to the industrialization and globalization and, and commoditization of food. And so this, this, we, have, we can't think of these two pandemics as separate because COVID-19 would not have been so severe if we didn't have the underlying pandemic of diabetes, obesity, and hypertension. And the public before COVID understood that food was making them sick, but were also incredibly confused. And so this is just a selection of things you can find online. You know, the public is deeply, deeply confused about what to do and where to go and how to, how to eat, eat healthy foods. Um, and this is a list of kind of what's going on in, in, in the United States, but also globally. Policymakers are focusing on single nutrient targets. Let's focus on fat or saturated fat or cholesterol or calories or sugar. And the public is uh, focusing on kind of silver 
magic bullet, like, let me just eat food that's natural or gluten-free or, or organic or local or even vegetarian. And, and I include vegetarian on this list as a misleading uh, a priority because, you know, French fries and Coca-Cola are vegetarian. Oreos are vegetarian. A lot of what's terrible in the food supply is vegetarian. So I don't think anything on this list actually by itself is, is sufficient to define a healthy diet. And so, you know, how did we get here? Well, um, oh, oh, be, before I, I go on to that, I just want to show you a couple of examples. This reductionist focus in policy of, of focusing on single nutrients and trying to define healthy foods by single nutrients is really rapidly accelerating um, in Mexico and Chile and the United Kingdom. And I don't think this is a good idea uh, with a couple of exceptions, additives, additives like salt and, and, and added sugar. It's reasonable to focus on, on, on additives. But beyond additives, you get really crazy guidance if you just have a reductionist approach to food. And crumpets is this great example that UK's number one crump crumpet gets all greens because it's low in fat, low in saturated fat, and low in added sugar. But of course, it's just refined starch. It's just glucose in a bag, and still it gets greens because of this reductionist focus. So uh, what I wanna really focus on in, in, in the rest of the talk is just really quickly what we've learned in the last 20 years. Um, what this chart shows you is the scientific publications in every decade since the 1960s on diet and cardiovascular disease, diet and diabetes, and diet and obesity. And you can see 1960s, 1970s, 1980s, even 1990s, we had some important foundational science, but much of what we've learned, much of the science has all happened after 2000. And most of that new science has not yet been translated to the public and has not yet been translated to policymakers. And so what I'm passionate about is translating the new science to the public and to policymakers mostly that we've learned in the last 20 years. So six quick lessons, and, and then I'm happy to go into all of these uh, in the Q&A. These are, I think, the six lessons that we've learned with the new science. First, focusing on single nutrients, in particular fat, saturated fat, or even total calories is misleading. Low calorie does not mean less obesogenic. Fat-free or low saturated fat or vitamin fortified does not mean good for you. This is not the right approach to fix the food system. Lesson number two, why I don't think we should focus on calories, growing science, all, all of which has happened in just the last 10 years, really shows quite clearly that you cannot judge a food by its calorie count alone when you're thinking about risk of obesity. Of course, short term, calories matter, and, and you, you can cut calories uh, and just count calories in short term over a few weeks or a couple of months, you might lose weight. But long term, food is biologic information. And adjusting, matching for calories, different foods provide different biologic information to our livers, to our brains, to our gut microbiomes, to our energy expenditure, to our hormones. And so we really have to look at food quality, not calories to, to address obesity. Lesson number three, obesity isn't the whole story. We've unfortunately become uh, come to a place where we're so worried about obesity that we use the words diet and obesity, obesity interchangeably. We say, oh, if somebody's thin or if a population's thin, their diets must be okay. And if a population is overweight or obese or a person is overweight or obese, their diet must be poor. That's not true. Obesity is just one single pathway by which diet affects health. And, I, and I, what I note here is that in the 80s and 90s, we were focused on blood lipids, blood cholesterol, as the major focus, worrying about heart attacks. And that led to the low-fat uh, low saturated fat dietary recommendation, which I think was, was a disaster. Now we're just focusing on obesity as though that's the only thing that's important. We have to really look at the whole world of effects of diet on our health, all of the pathways that are all incredibly interesting and important beyond just worrying about obesity and blood cholesterol. Lesson number four, all of this can happen very quickly. And I think this is really, really um, not widely appreciated, how fast changes in diet work. There's this misperception that it takes months or years to, to, to change health of a person or a population through changes in diet quality. What this slide summarizes is several randomized controlled trials showing the drops in blood pressure, LDL cholesterol, triglycerides, glucose, insulin, and, and, and other risk factors within just six to eight weeks, just by changing diet quality, without any weight loss. All of these trials gave calorie match diets and there was no weight loss. And in just six to eight weeks, you can see dramatic improvements in metabolic health. And so 
I see the last six months globally as a major missed opportunity. While we've been talking about social distancing and mask wearing and contact tracing, we should have absolutely been prioritizing a healthy diet, physical activity, sleep, and stress reduction because we could have rapidly improved the metabolic health of our population. Even just a few percentage points of improvement would have helped bend the curve and can still help bend the curve for COVID-19. Lesson number five, what are the current priorities? I think there are you know, three buckets of priorities. There's foods that are good for us, foods that are kind of neutral, and foods that are really bad for us. And, and I focus on foods, not nutrients, because as I mentioned, with the exception of additives like trans fat or sodium uh, or, or added sugar, we really must focus on foods. Uh, and, and we shouldn't focus on, on really any nutrients beyond additives. And there's you know, really three groups. There's foods that are protective, um, fruits, nuts, fish, vegetables. And, and remember, most vegetables are actually fruits, plant oils, whole grains, beans, yogurt. These are all phytochemical rich, fiber-rich, minimally processed foods that have a range of benefits. Fish also has omega-3s. Yogurt also has probiotics that are really, really good for our health, and we should be maximizing this. This is a positive message for the public. This is a positive message for industry. We need to be talking to our governments about instituting policies that rewards companies economically, rewards companies through invest investors or through, through tax policy who add more of these foods uh, to, to their products. Then there are foods to eat in moderation, foods that are kind of more neutral, cheese, poultry, milk, eggs, butter, unprocessed red meat. Cheese may be a little bit better than, than neutral because uh, as a fermented food, it may reduce risk of diabetes. And unprocessed meat's a little bit worse than neutral because if you eat more than one or two servings per week, uh, will, seems to increase the risk of, of diabetes. And then the worst thing in the food supply that we really have to be cutting down is refined grains, starches, and sugars, processed meats, very high sodium foods and industrial trans fat. And I really emphasize grain starches and sugars. There's m much more calories from refined grains and starches in the food supply than from sugars. So I, I worry about a focus on sugar alone. We have to be focusing on starch and sugar together. Uh, and of course, there's a lot of emerging science, a lot of things we still need to understand, the gut microbiome, personalized nutrition, the optimal food processing, the effective additives, timing of meals, on and on. So we don't have all the answers, but I think we know enough that, to focus on these three priority groups. And then lastly, lesson number six, if we're gonna fix the food system, we have to have policy change, we have to have systems change. When we have the entire world, every nation in the world having increasing obesity, not a single nation has been able to reduce obesity. When we have every nation in the world with increasing type two diabetes, we have every segment of the population with increasing obesity and diabetes. Um, this is not an individual problem. This is not a problem of choice or free will. We have a broken system. And, you know, I won't have time to go into all the details, but I think that, you know, three top priorities should be healthcare, using healthcare dollars to pay for healthy food, what, what, uh, what I call food is medicine, through produce prescription programs or medically tailored meals or, or, or other things. And I know there's faculty at the George Institute who are interested in these interventions. Um, economic incentives not just taxes. I do think taxes are important for soda, for sugar, for salt, but also incentives, incentives for companies, ESG metrics, B corporations, tax policy for innovation, using government feeding programs like SNAP and WIC, both the carrots and sticks for economic incentives. And lastly, something that I think has not been uh, uh, discussed enough is we don't have all the science. We really don't have all the science to answer all the questions. So we need a global moonshot to figure out nutrition. We're, we're figuring it out slowly. We'll figure it out in 50 years, but, but we don't have 50 years to wait. And so in the United States, for example, I believe we need a new National Institute of Nutrition at the NIH. We need public-private partnerships. We need fundamental discovery. We need to use big data. In Australia, similarly, the government should, should be pressed to make a major new investment in nutrition science. If you, if you ask them how much they're spending on medical treatment for type 2 diabetes and obesity and hypertension, they should give 5% of that for nutrition science to address the problem. So I'm really delighted to have spoken. Um, I really think it's time in the United States and Australia for a national moonshot to fix the food system, to leverage food as medicine, incentivize and shift to real food, build a strong public health and food infrastructure, and rapidly expand critical nutrition research. And this is a quote actually from England, but I think it applies everywhere in the world. 
a massive campaign on diet would save lives and change the course of our nation's health forever. Um, so thank you so much again uh, for uh, allowing me to, to be a part of this conference, and I look forward to a Q&A. Thank you so much, Dr. Musavarian. There's lots of really, really interesting um, food for thought in there, and I've been sort of scribbling down facts as, as you've been speaking. Interestingly, it was um, in the context of uh, COVID-19 several months ago in Australia when um, I was actually jogging around our, the Bay Run in Sydney, which people in Sydney will know is an iconic run, and we had the big screens reminding people to do social distancing, and I was listening to your podcast where you were saying you know, governments actually should be using this opportunity to also educate people about diets. And that's what I thought we'd, it would be really great to have Dr. Mustafari and come and come and speak with us today. So that was the impetus for inviting you. So great to hear you talk about that. I'd be really keen to know whether there have been any, you know, whether the government is starting to make changes in terms of food policy in the context. Um, of COVID-19 in the US? What, what sort of um, actions have been taken, if any, and what are the yeah. lessons for other countries? Yeah, so I would say there's, there's the you know, positive and the negative. So the positive is before COVID-19, we've actually had very good um, um, progress in speaking to the federal government and to some state governments about actions around COVID-19, uh, excuse me, uh, uh, actions around food and nutrition. Uh, and so, We've been able to form a food as medicine working group in the House, and so it's a bipartisan working group of both Republican and Democratic lawmakers who believe in food as medicine. We've had a, there was a bill introduced to test and, in, uh, and implement medically tailored meals in Medicare. Uh, Medicare is a $750 million a year um, um, healthcare program, and so to implement food, food as medicine in that, um, we, uh, in the state of Massachusetts, there's an ongoing $150 million uh, pilot project, letting healthcare pay for for healthy food. Uh, we're, we're working on we're working on a lot of a lot of things, and I think progress is being made. COVID nineteen has upended that and put a pause on all of that. And as you know, in our country, COVID nineteen has become politicized, unfortunately. And so the the current and with the elections, um, there's so much you know current political divisiveness that really we're not going to have any significant progress. Uh, between now and uh, uh, and the and the elections, um, I, I will say that you know COVID nineteen did lead to expanded benefits for uh, food nutrition programs, just giving more dollars to people who've lost their jobs, and that was effective, uh, and that was important. But in terms of nutrition, true nutrition, COVID nineteen unfortunately you know blocked some of the progress because uh, of all the political divisiveness, and it's a really really big missed opportunity. It's a shame. And with the elections coming up, do you think it would make any difference for food policy? Whoever wins, you've got two, week, two weeks. Are they campaigning on food policy? Is there anything in the, in the manifestos that makes you think one party might be better than the other? So, so you know, we've written a couple of op-eds in, in U.S. Uh, media outlets about this, that, you know, food is the single biggest issue not being discussed. It's, it's you know, every debate, every conversation, there's a question about education, or not national security, COVID, you know, Russia, on and on. And yet, the number one cause of poor health, the number one issue for the economy, the number one issue for sustainability in agriculture, a major issue for, for structural racism and disparities, never a single question on this. So this has been, uh, and I think this is true globally in every, in every country, you know, this has not been raised by the, by the citizens to their government as a, as a top, top priority. And so I think every country, every, every citizen needs to tell their government food is a big deal. I will say that uh, the Joe, Joe Biden did do a one hour um, uh, um, live you know, kind of webinar with Chef Jose Andres on food. So that after he, he won the nomination. So that's the first time in, in his recent history that I know of that a, you know, the presidential nominee for, from a party spent an entire hour talking about food. So that, that there is positive movement. Um, I, I think that, you know, wh whichever a, a, a party wins, I think it's really important for us to, to, to work with the administration and Congress to keep pushing forward food policy. I do think that the, a Biden administration would likely be more um, open to those, those suggestions. But really, this is a nonpartisan issue. If you look at the economic consequences, if you look at the national security consequences, if you look at the, the consequences for business, 
this should, it should really be a nonpartisan issue. And that's where I'd like to see um, academic organizations like the George Institute and like Tufts to work with business, government leaders, healthcare leaders, to sort of take away the siloed approach and stop talking about food as though it's just a human right issue or just a human health issue and bring in the economic discussion, the national security discussion. Because I think if you bring those things in, hopefully we can start to tear down some of these walls and partisanship. Thank you. Yeah, I think that's really interesting. Just to come back a little bit on the on the question of industry. And obviously, one of the challenges is that, you know, if processing of foods and commercialization adds value. And actually, what we want to see really is a shift away from processed foods towards fresh, healthy foods. So how do you see that playing out in the in the current political climate? Yeah. Well, I don't know if fresh, healthy foods is the right approach, because I think companies are going to need to create shelf-stable processed products that are healthy. So that's, that's, the future is going in that direction, right? People are busier than ever. And, and you know, I think healthy processed foods is what, what, what we need and more fresh foods as well, but not just fresh foods. Um, I think that, that um, you know, the I've thought about this a lot and, and written, you know, um, some papers on kind of the history of how we got here. And, and the way I look at it um, is that we have a legacy food system that was purposefully built to, to meet the needs of the 1930s, 1940s, 1950s, and 1960s. And, and the food system did what we asked it to do. And, and where we are today was very purposeful, not nefarious, but very purposeful. In the 1930s, 40s, 50s, and 60s, there were two major global concerns around food. One was nutrient deficiencies, um, diseases like scurvy and plagra and beriberi, because those were just discovered and, and, and proven to be, the diseases weren't discovered, but the vitamins and nutrients were discovered and synthesized uh, and shown to be protective in the 1930s and 1940s. On top of that, we had World War II, the Great Depression, which led to food shortages. And then at the same time, we had recognition by, you know, uh, population scientists that we were going to have a massive population explosion on the earth, one that had never been seen before in human history. And there were projections that we were going to have a billion people starve by 2000. And so that led to the Green Revolution. Uh, you know, the Rockefeller Foundation, other organizations very consciously went to food and said, look, we don't have enough food and vitamin deficiencies are a problem. So what we need to do is we need to create, you know, cheap, inexpensive, shelf-stable, starchy calories that are fortified with vitamins, and that'll fix the problem. And that's exactly what happened. And so, you know, between 1930 and now, there's been massive global reductions in nutrient deficiency diseases because of fortification of foods. And there's been massive reductions in pure caloric hunger. We, of course, have poor nutrition, but pure caloric hunger has gone way down. And so that was a success. It was a great success. And it really wasn't until the 1990s that all of us started taking seriously food and chronic disease. And so we've taken this massive global food system that we've created, public health scientists helped push to create, and we're now telling it to shift because of new science. Um, and, and, so, and so, you know, I think what we have now, and, and if you just go down the cereal aisle in a grocery store, that cereal aisle was purposefully created, right? Starchy, shelf-stable, cheap calories that are vitamin fortified. That's what we asked the food system to do. Now what we have is this legacy food system that did what we asked it to do in the last century, but is woefully inadequate for the diet-related chronic disease epidemic that we have now, and in fact helped cause it, unintentionally helped cause it. And now we have this legacy food system. We have players who've made a lot of money and have a lot of power and have a lot, have a lot of um, stake to keep the food system the way it is, or at least not lose their share. So I think that, you know, at the end of the day, um, big food from agriculture to restaurants to retail to manufacturers, big food is not big tobacco because, you know, it's not a fight to the death. They, we, they can shift their products. But we need to help them shift their products. We need to make it economically viable for them to shift their products. Because if we just say, make healthier food, and one company does it and other companies don't, they'll lose market share, they'll go out of business, and it won't work. And so I think this is a carrot and a stick approach. You have to have the stick. You have to say, look, if you don't change, you know, we're going we're gonna to have penalties. And 
We're also going to level the playing field through things like, you know, sodium targets, sugar targets, which should be maybe mandatory for some additives, and that levels the playing field. But we have to add the carrots. We have to show business innovators, entrepreneurs, that if they do the right thing, we'll, we'll give them financial rewards. And so I think that model um, is important. And so I guess that was a long answer to a complex question, but, you know, my big picture perspectives are, one, the food system today is what we asked it to be. And so we, we have to remember that. It wasn't nefariously built to make us sick. Um, and, and, and then secondly, you know, food companies are highly heterogeneous. There's a lot of innovation going on. It's not like big tobacco. And so I think combining, you know, sticks with carrots is crucial. Thanks very much. Really, really interesting. We've got a ton of questions coming in from the audience now, but just before I turn to those, just wanted to introduce uh, Dr. Ali Jones, who's from the George Institute. She's a lawyer and public health advocate here, and, and I think she's got a question for you. Thanks, Ali. Yeah, thanks for this discussion. I think probably some of my um, questions have been answered just in the discussion now, but some of them, but I mean, we've touched on the importance of government policy here to address a food system. And in Australia, we don't have a national nutrition policy. And we do have this sort of range of soft regulations like voluntary reformulation, a voluntary front of pack. Um, we don't have a sugar tax because the Beverage Council said they'll voluntarily reduce the sugar. Um, but we have really no evidence that any of these things are doing much um, and government keeps investing in them. Um, so I guess I'm interested in how we as advocates really sell this stronger, smarter types of regulation to policymakers as a best buy. Um, you know, why, why do some countries have the political will to regulate, even if they don't, even if they've maybe picked policies that you said aren't the, aren't the best we could do, but they're, they're going strong. And here we're, we're just not doing anything. <laughs> so what's missing? Yeah, well, so I think that, you know, you mentioned like, and I showed like Mexico and Chile, they have their black box warning labels. If they had had black box warning labels that, you know, highlighted, let's say salt and starch and sugar together, not just sugar, I would have been, I think that's excellent. I think it's a terrible idea that they're highlighting fat and saturated fat because they're going to drive people to starch. They're going to drive people to starchy, starchy, refined products. And if they combine it with green lights for things that are good for you, right, to give industry again the green, they only gave them the bad. But as you said, it has happened in, the, in those nations. Um, so this is, you know, political science. And this is why we need more multidisciplinary experts who understand nutrition, who understand law, who understand economics, who understand political science. I'm not a political scientist, but in my conversations with congressional leaders in the United States, I have found that, that economics is the number one argument that, that sells, gets people's attention. So if you can show the dollars that the government is losing um, through healthcare spending, lost productivity, tax revenue, and show it to the local politician in their own district. Um, and we're trying to do research that, uh, we're trying to do that kind of research here in the United States supported by the NIH. If you can show them the dollar losses, then and convince and show them that if you implement this policy, you will gain these dollars back, I think you will have a much better chance of action. Thank you. Thanks so much. Moving on to some questions from the audience now. We've got a lot coming in. Um, there's one here from Professor Tim Gill, University of Sydney, I think linked to what you were just saying. Um, does Dr. Mustafarian feel that the concept of food as medicine runs the risk of suggesting that single food products can deal with health issues around nutrition? Yeah, it's a great question. And, and we did think about this a lot. You know, food as is, food is medicine or food as medicine, um, you know, can lead to kind of this reductionist supplement medical foods kind of approach. Um, and, and so, you know, other ways that it could be pitched, but we have found that in the United States over just the last few years, this is rapidly gaining ground and this terminology is being understood. And so we have major insurance companies, major healthcare organizations, states, all investing in kind of these food as medicine interventions. And so we just have to define food as medicine. And, and there's, uh, Harvard Law School has a nice food as medicine pyramid that they've created. It shows that, you know, at the top of the pyramid is medically tailored meals, then produce prescription programs, then um, uh, um, feeding food assistance and nutrition programs, and then sort of general guidance and prevention for all. So food as medicine really should be about the, the broad concept that food is core to health, and food needs to be integrated into the healthcare system, whether it's 
medical education, uh, excuse me, nutrition education for doctors, whether it's nutrition being in the healthcare record, but most importantly, whether it's health insurance dollars paying for food. We've done several analyses showing that um, if uh, health insurance paid a subsidy for fruits and vegetables, it would improve health and be about as cost effective as you know, generic uh, drugs uh, like statins or blood pressure lowering medication. And so if we pay for drugs for cholesterol lowering and blood pressure, we should also pay for food. So I think that, you know, to respond to Professor Gill, there is that risk. And so I think you have to mitigate that risk by, by bringing together coalitions and talking about food as medicine. And it has been effective in the United States. And I actually think the United States is behind the world in so many ways but this may be one of the few areas we're actually ahead is, is there's a lot of food as medicine interventions going on right now in the United States. Thanks very much. That's really interesting. And I know we've got some work, similar work going on at, at the George Institute as well. I've got another question here from Annette Hook, um, who, who works with me. And um, we've just done a survey and the initial results show that most consumers here in Australia associate COVID-19 outcomes with lung related conditions wrongly, things like asthma, and actually very little with cardiovascular disease and obesity. Do you think it's important to explain to the public this link? And what are the sort of opportunities for doing this in this area, especially considering we haven't been that successful in nutrition education to date? Yeah. To, to explain the link between poor nutrition and COVID? Yeah. 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 Yeah, I mean, I saw in the chat somebody else mentioned sort of an Armageddon event. I mean, boy, if COVID's not going to do it, right, um, it's hard to think what else would. Yeah, this is a major, major lost opportunity. And so, um, you know, we're writing about it. We're trying to write op-eds and get it out in the media. Um, others are writing about it. There's definitely a layer of people who who understand this and, and who are, are getting this and starting to talk about it. But it's not still, I think, widely appreciated or understood how strong these linkages are. And, you know, really what we should have be doing is, is doing trials. And, and we've tried to get funding rapidly for some trials like this, and we haven't been successful because, again, there's not the, the same, you know, um, belief in food as in, as in, let's say, drugs. But if we could test very quickly, right, is improving your metabolic health through physical activity and diabetes, does it lead to better outcomes with COVID, right? That would be very important. Um, I, I think that that, you know, takes time, right? It takes time to do research. In the meantime, I think institutions like, like the George should work with your policymakers and media organizations and advocacy organizations and get this message out, right? If, if you have, there was a, a paper published in China um, just within the last month. Um, they looked at a thousand diabetics in China that were hospitalized with COVID-19. Overall, the mortality rate was 8%. So 8% of the, the, of the people died uh, when they were hospitalized with COVID-19. If their diabetes was poorly controlled, 11% of them died. If their diabetes was well controlled, 1% of them died. 1% versus 11%. So that kind of a message that if you're metabolically healthy, COVID might be much less of a problem. You know, somehow we have to shout it from the rooftops. I think you're right. Another question here is, um, and again from Christina Bastaka, what do you think are some of the reasons for the disconnect between the scientists, pol policy and public incorrect nutritional information? And what do you think are some of the best ways to bridge this divide? Yeah. Well, it's a very new science. And so the science of nutrition and chronic diseases is 30 years old, 40 years old at most. Um, you know, of course, again, there was some foundational science in the 70s, some foundational science in the 80s, but most of the modern science on nutrition and chronic diseases is in the last 30 years, and that's mostly cardiovascular disease. Um, the science of nutrition and obesity, I would say, is 15 years old, you know, realistically, significant, important studies. The science of nutrition and cancer, nutrition and brain health, um, nutrition and kidney health is, is even newer. So, you know, we have to just be patient and recognize this is really new stuff. And in the 1970s, nobody was talking about this, nobody. And so, and so um, you know, I think that the, the challenge, as I said, is we, we, the first, most of the 20th century, we focused on the lens of nutrition, that food was a delivery vehicle. Food was a delivery vehicle to give calories and vitamins. And we've shifted and we're telling the public we were wrong. It's not just about calories and vitamins and low fat, 
we have to think about all this other stuff. And, and it's only been 20 years that we've really shifted the message. So, so I'm, I'm optimistic. I feel like, you know, 20 years is a short time and, and people are starting to pay attention. And maybe the, the real, um, you know, uh, best route is millennials. Um, I, I don't know if you call them millennials in Australia, but they, you know, the youngest, the youngest generation. They are completely um, um, rejecting sort of traditional food brands and traditional food companies. They're going for interesting new products that they think have authenticity, health, sustainability. And so I think approaching them and pushing them and, and working with millennials and young influencers could really be a way to accelerate this, this recognition. Thanks very much. Um, linked to that, we've got a question here from Karen Charlton at the University of Wollongong. She says sustainable diets are the big focus right now. So how can we piggyback this new movement, consumer interest to encourage dietary changes more broadly? Yeah, well, there's been a lot of progress um, in trying to link um, nutrition uh, and sustainability together. And we have an entire division the Division of Agriculture, Food, and Environment, which 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 tries to do that, and several great faculty. Um, you know, the Eat Lancet report tried to sort of put those things together. Um, other reports um, from the United Nations uh, tried to put those two things together. Clearly, food is the single biggest issue for sustainability on the planet, and it's the single biggest issue for nutrition on the planet. Um, but I do think the overlap of those things has been exaggerated a little bit. Um, you know. The single biggest priority for the food system for sustainability is to eat less meat, red meat. That's not the single biggest priority for health. And in fact, if we stopped eating red meat you know, globally, we'd have a pretty small impact on health. And even in low-income countries, we might hurt health a little bit. The single biggest problem in the food supply for chronic disease is the starch and sugar, I think, and also sodium um, and, and hyper-processing of foods. Those things are actually environmentally quite good. It's, it's very environmentally good to have lots of processed foods and starch and sugar. So, so I think um, we need to, to combine those messages because we'll reach more people and we do need to combine those messages. But I think we should be wary of the um, overly appealing overlap. Like there's a perfect overlap. You know, a healthy diet is also the most sustainable diet. Fruits, nuts, there's a lot of food waste. They're not the most efficient plants to grow, um, you know, compared to let's say wheat. So, so I think we have to be a little bit careful, but, but I do think putting it all together that it's a food systems problem and we need to address food systems uh, is, is the right approach. I think there's a question from Mark Lawrence. Um, what's your view about using nutrient profiling algorithms to assess the healthiness of foods? Um, would ultra processed foods be a better approach? Or yeah, great question. Yeah, great question. So um, I think there are some pretty good nutrient profiling systems uh, among the ones in major use. Australia's Health Star rating is one of the, the better ones for sure. Um, you know, it, to have a reasonable nutrient profiling system, you need to combine good and bad together. Um, and, you know, the access to nutrition index is using the Health Star rating. Um, we've actually, in the last year, uh, at Tufts developed a nutrient profiling system called Food Compass, which we're, we hope to publish on and, and pub transparently publish the algorithm. And what we've done there is we've incorporated, you know, foods and, 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 excuse me, we've incorporated, you know, nutrients and macronutrients and micronutrients, but also several novel things. We've actually incorporated processing, including good and bad processing into it. We've incorporated trotinoids and flavanols and other things. We've in incorporated more additives. So, so we think that um, you know a nutrient profiling system that puts it all together um, will be even better than some of the very good ones out there now, like like Australia's Health Stars. I think processing by itself is not the right approach. Um, I think that right now, on average, ultra processed foods are bad for you, but that's on average, and there's better for you and worse for you ultra processed foods. And similarly, um, you know processed foods rather than ultra processed foods, there's better ones and there's worse ones. So I think the current science of processing uh, and the current categorization of processing is still too simplified. Um, I'd like to see more science and more nuance. Um, uh, and so I think processing should be one component now um, uh, of, a, of a more advanced nutrient profiling system. 
thank you. Another question here from Sherry Russell. She says, I'm curious about the focus on added sugar and the potential for non-nutritive sweetness to create a halo for foods that undercuts our nutrition-based policy. Could you speak to this? Yeah, sure. Um, I actually have, I'm going to digress first. I have a bigger concern. I think the much more, more real concern is that the focus on added sugars will shift people to starch. And I have some slides. If you look at breakfast cereals, if you look at, you know, nut-based products, bean-based products, a lot of the healthiest products that are, that are processed products that are out there have some added sugars because they're wheat bran, whole oats, other minimally processed foods, and they add a little bit of sugar to make them palatable. And in contrast, a lot of foods with no added sugar, that crumpet example, breads, you know, cornflakes, special K example, potatoes, example after example have no added sugar, yet they're 100% glucose and metabolically are just as bad for you. So I'm more worried that the focus on added sugar will drive people to starch. Um, I think a focus on added sugar in beverages makes perfect sense. There's no reason to have sugar in your drink other than like, you know, a half teaspoon you put in yourself. I'm talking about industrial levels of, of sweetener. But I think the focus on added sugars without starch is, is a danger. Now, now back to your question about non-nutritive sweeteners. Um, I view those sweeteners as a bridge not as a destination. So I, I think it's pretty clear that if you drink a ton of soda or if you crave, you know, hyper sweet, if you switch to non-nutritive sweeteners, it's better for you. It's definitely better for you. Um, people who say, oh, I'm going to drink a regular Coke rather than a diet Coke because it's natural, that's just, that's absurd, right? It's always better to have the diet soda than to have the regular soda. But I, I, I do agree that it will give products halo effects. It may change people's taste buds. If a kid is used to hyper sweet, will a carrot taste sweet to them anymore, right? Um, a carrot is sweet, actually. So I think that non-nutritive sweeteners shouldn't be viewed as innocuous. They should be viewed as a bridge that's better than the loads and loads of, of added sugar we have now in the food supply, but, but it isn't the final destination. Thank you. That's yeah, really useful to hear that view. Um, a question here from Wendy Spencer. It says, how big is the influence of manufacturer lobbyists on the US and Australia governments? Um, it'd be good to hear your views, obviously, on the US. And if you can reflect on how that might be in Australia, that would be great. Well, I mean, I think what I've learned is that, you know, um, in a democracy, um, lobbying is, is part of a democracy. You go in and you give your, your report. And what we have is we have organized lobbyists for industries and we don't have organized lobbyists for public health or, or other things. So I think lobbying, which means citizen organizations going to Congress to get their, their, their views heard is normal and accepted. And, and to think that we're gonna get rid of lobbying is not gonna happen unless we get rid of kind of the democratic process. So I think what we need to do is two things. First, organize, sorry, so, I, I guess just direct answer, huge influence, right? A huge influence, obviously huge influence. But, you know, the American College of Cardiology lobbies, the American Heart Association lobbies, the NAACP lobbies, the American Association of Retired Persons lobbies, the gun lobby lobbies, everybody lobbies. So, so I think what we need to do is two things. One, we need to create more effective lobbies and funding streams for coalitions of academic organizations, public health organizations, groups that have traditionally been splintered and poor and not organize. We need to organize. And second, we need to co-opt and enter and start working with those existing lobbies. Um, and as just one example, I mentioned our push for national nutrition research. We came out with a report this summer pushing forward national nutrition research as a priority in this country. And many, many companies have signed on. Many companies have signed on. PepsiCo has signed on. Um, uh, um, General, I, I'll have to look at the list, but the Kroger has signed, you know, many, many big food companies have signed on as supportive. They say, yeah, we want more nutrition science. And so we have a coalition of over 80 companies that have signed on to, to more nutrition science being helpful to them. So that's an example of where you, if you can find common cause, you can actually, in a positive way, co opt those lobbying dollars for, for good. Fantastic. And I think, yeah, creating sort of advocacies to, to try and improve nutrition is certainly advocacy coalitions to improve nutrition is certainly something that we're, we're interested in here at the George Institute. Um, going back to COVID um, 
briefly and uh, another question from the audience. Are there any established nutritional guidelines, including supplementation for people infected with COVID? And if there are any links for better and faster recovery, if you could comment on that, please. Yeah, so, uh, so the, the quick answer is no, there's not been enough science to you know, make any um, concrete recommendations. Um, but there are a, a range of really interesting nutrients, natural compounds, both vitamins and other more rare phenolics and flavonoids that have extremely compelling evidence for possible benefits for treatment for COVID. And not only for treatment for COVID, but for boosting the vaccine immune response. When we get a vaccine, we know that the elderly, obese, di diabetic patients will be more likely to have significantly blunted vaccine responses. That happens with influenza, that happens with hepatitis vaccine, that happens with other vaccines. So I think there's a, a many, many nutrients that are really promising to potentially both treat COVID, especially early in the course, right when you're first diagnosed, uh, and secondly, to boost the vaccine immune response. We need trials to do that. And you know we are working at Tufts. We have a protocol we've developed. We have um, a, a budget and we've been trying to get funding. And again, nutrition doesn't get the respect it, it deserves. We went to NIH, we went to the Gates Foundation. We weren't able to, to get funding. We're, we're talking now to other funders. Um, there have been a couple of very, very small pilot trials of vitamin D in very, very severely ill uh, patients in the ICU. They've been very small, they've been open label, not double blinded, but their preliminary results are quite promising. Um, and, and as you may or may not know, when uh, President Trump received COVID, he did get, but when he got COVID, he did get vitamin D. Um, so I think there are nutrients that, that could be taken. Um, I have a list myself of nutrients that I think are really promising. And um, if I get, I have them in my cupboard, um, if I get COVID or anyone in my family will get COVID, there's a cocktail of, of several nutrients that I think we should take and I'll take those. But, um, but I don't feel comfortable yet, you know, uh, advocating for those or, or saying what those are until we have science to show that it actually works. Thanks very much. There's one more question here from the audience. Sorry. Could I just add, Jackie? But, but I will say, based on what we know about obesity, diabetes, hypertension, poor metabolic health, just eating kind of a healthy diet, a, a, a high healthy fat Mediterranean style diet, changing your habits, adding more fruits, nuts, healthy oils, fish to your plate, eating less starch and sugar, um, that's got to help. It's got to help, right? That's got to be uh, an acceptable recommendation. Sorry, I just wanted to be sure that was clear. No, I, th I think that's clear. But I think that, I mean, part of the challenge is that the messages that are getting across to consumers about nutrition science are often, you know, really complex and, and focusing on the things that we don't know. And, and yet what you've said just now, these messages are very simple. You know, you need to eat more fresh fruit and vegetables, you need to eat more, more grains, you need to eat more nuts. Why, where are we going wrong? Why aren't we managing to get these what are fairly simple messages to the public about diet across effectively? Well, there's been, we are, we are getting the messages across. People know, right? If you ask them, they mostly know, although they still also, most, the majority of Americans, I'm sure the majority of Australians also still probably believe that low-fat diets are good for weight loss. So they're still confused about, about you know, uh, older messages, but they know that those are healthy foods. There's very, very good literature, very, very strong literature from every behavior change field, whether it's smoking or um, um, wearing seatbelts or um, um, physical activity, you know, knowledge alone doesn't change behavior. And so I think we've had this, you know, tremendous overemphasis on knowledge and tremendous overemphasis on just telling the public what to do and hoping that, that if they're educated, they'll do it. And I still hear people all the time say, we need to bring back nutrition education in schools and we need to do this and do that. Knowledge alone does not change behavior. We have a broken system. We have to change the price points of healthy foods and have true cost accounting so healthy food costs less and healthy food costs more. We have to change the culture and changing the culture means um, uh, you know, having uh, influencers, prominent people who really say, just like it's no longer cool to smoke, it's not cool to have a hot dog. It's not cool to have Cheetos or Fritos. It's not cool to, to go to a fast food restaurant and have the worst thing on the menu. And we're, we're, we get the opposite, right? We have the opposite right now. We have, we have movie stars and musicians actually in commercials for some of these, some of these products. 
So, so I think that, that the mistake that's been made where we're going wrong is focusing too much on informing the public and not enough on changing the system. And, and Jackie, I'll give just one example that I like to use. There's two examples. One is, is safety of cars. If we look at how safe cars have become over the last 80 or 90 years, there's been massive advances in car safety um, uh, and, and reductions in death from car accidents. And that's not really been done by telling the driver to drive better, right? It's been done by changing the car. Many, many things we did to change the car. Uh, changing the environment, the roads, the, the um, you know, speed limits, rumble strips, you know, all kinds of road engineering to avoid accidents. And it's been done by changing the culture around drunk driving. So that's the roadmap to change food. We have to change the products. We have to change the environment and we have to change the culture. And the other example I'll give is toys. Um, imagine if we had a system where the vast majority of toys in the world were unsafe. We knew they were hurting children when they use them every day, and in fact, many times for killing children. And so if you went into any toy store in the world, 80% of the toys there we knew were unsafe. And all we were doing is telling parents that they were unsafe, putting labeling on the toys so that they could pick and choose which toys were more or less safe, having every five years toy, toy purchasing guidelines so people could, could know, you know which toys to purchase or which toys not to purchase, telling, um, you know, poor or minority or less educated um, moms and dads that, well, you know, you may not have as much time or as much money, so sorry, you know, you just have to do your best, right? That's what we're doing in the food system, right? We're just, we're, we're leaving it to the consumer. We have to take those, you know, um, get rid of those unsafe toys and be sure that every toy is reasonably safe. That's what we have to do with, with food. Thanks very much, um, Dr. Mostavarin. It's been absolutely fabulous um, talking to you. And, and I, there, are, there are lots more questions um, that keep coming in, but I think we, we need to start drawing this to a close so you can um, get off for your dinner. Um, from my perspective, yeah, there's been so much rich information in here. Just jumping out, you know, the fact that you're saying it takes six to eight weeks to improve your 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 health. And I think that's the sort of message that isn't necessarily getting across to consumers. People think it takes ages and they have to lose weight. So that I think that's a that's a key message I'll take away from this. And and really to conclude, you know, the the main message is that every nation in the world is is um suffering sort of increases in and obesity and, and diet related diseases and as you said this is not an individual problem and it's not a problem of free will we really need to fix the system you've given us a whole range of different examples of how we can do that and i'm sure many people are here will be going away inspired and thinking about how they can work on some of those things so thank you so much for sharing your insights with us it's been a great pleasure having you here thank you oh of course I have great respect for the George Institute, you know, one of the leading institutions in the world, uh, folks like Bruce Neal, my former colleague uh, and current colleague, Jason Wu, others that are there. Um, you know, I look forward to working with as many people as possible, collaborating together. Um, Australia has been still more, more progressive than the US in many ways, uh, uh, and so there's a lot that can be done, and I look forward to further conversation and collaboration. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you very much. Goodbye, thank you.